And uh, now what happens is that this is A tilde, and this guy is B tilde. B tilde lifts to a path. And now what you find is that the, uh, that the automorphisms of this covering space over the base is isomorphic to Z. And that Z is actually generated by the path lifts of A. And, um, and this covering space is coming from a, a mapping from the fundamental group of the base uh, to the integers, which is taking uh, B to uh, zero so that the lift of B is a loop. And you can look at uh, all the issues of the path lifting. It's just a good example. So I recommend the example to you can look at the issues of path lifting in there and how the formalism that we were using for path lifting uh, works when you are here. And what you will find is that the formalism works the same way, but we are going to be setting B equal to one because B acts uh, identically on the covering space. So I leave it to you as an exercise. And we could talk about that at another point if we want to go into the calculus of Fox more carefully. So, so that's all I'm going to say today about that. But I, I, I will come back to it at some point. Um, so let's talk about virtual knot theory. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a diagrammatic definition first. And then I'll talk about topological interpretation second. But I'm going to tell you about the topological idea first on the next slide, and then we'll we'll work with the diagrammatic interpretation. So um, let's see here. All right, so first let me begin with a topological idea, but I'm not going to formalize it uh, completely until later. Suppose that instead of drawing diagrams on the two-dimensional sphere, we decided to draw diagrams on a torus. So I'm going to think about diagrams on a surface. usually oriented. But actually, it's quite interesting to think about diagrams on an unoriented surface, and we could do that too, but I'm working with oriented here. And you could have a knot diagram on a surface just as much as you could have a knot diagram on the two-dimensional sphere or in the plane. But it then respects some things about the topology of the surface. For example, here's a nice di knot diagram drawn on the surface of a torus. So now you begin to imagine, well, I can do the whole theory, right? We can, we can do knot theory. on S1 cross S1 on the torus, call it T, right? Um, and, um, and in fact, 
uh, it corresponds to embeddings of circles in the torus cross the unit integral. And then we we're, we're actually have a target manifold, the, the three-dimensional manifold. It's a thickened torus. And the diagram represents a diagram for this knot in the thickened torus. So I can talk about diagrams on a surface, or I can talk about embeddings in the surface across the unit interval. I'll talk about diagrams on the surface, and then we just use Rademeister moves. So this is a knot theory you could study. And, and in fact, this is really what virtual knot theory is about in a certain sense. However, if you were to take a projection of a situation like this, then you see some features that might recommend themselves to you for thinking about diagrams. So suppose that I projected this into a plane And I, for, I kind of forgot about the surface. I'm just projecting the knot into the plane. Well, then I see the following situation. I see an ordinary knot diagram. With a crossing that I obviously have to handle in some special way. So I'm going to put a little circle around it and call it a virtual crossing. So this is a virtual crossing. And as you see, it is an artifact of taking this knot, which is living on the torus, living in genus one, and projecting it down into the plane, uh, this crossing here is not uh, a weaving crossing on the torus. It just happens that when you projected this curve, which went around the back of the torus, and this curve, which is over on the top, projected to a crossing down there. But it's not a crossing up here. Not a crossing up here. These are the re real crossings up here. So I, I can consider diagrams of this type. And uh, and so what I'm about to do is tell you a diagrammatic theory uh, of handling such diagrams, but it is in fact going to correspond to handling knots uh, up in surfaces, but up to some forgettery uh, that is quite obvious when you start to think about making projections. For example, the knot that I just drew, the knot that I just drew is living on a torus, but it could have been living in a higher genus surface. You just didn't think about that other handle there, right? Might have had a little handle over there. Um, and, uh, and the projection map doesn't see it. So, so in fact, that leads me to think about taking uh, uh, liberties with the surface in which the knot sits. Why should I think of this knot in a double torus when I can think of it in the torus? I can allow myself to do surgeries on the ambient surface and cut away extra handles that don't matter. Uh, the theory, the diagrammatic theory that I'm going to tell you I'll write it in the slide so we have a record of it. And then this is a promise, which I will come back and explain. It's easy to explain the diagrammatic theory and take some extra talk to relate it to the topology in the way that I was just saying. So that's why I wanted to motivate the topology and then and then give you a chance to think about that and then come back to it. So we will describe
a planar diagrammatic theory that corresponds to stabilized knots in thickened surfaces. And by stabilized, I mean exactly that you could look for a curve and cut along that curve and put a disc in and get rid of the handle. Or, or you could add a handle that didn't interfere with the knot diagram that was in the complement of the, so you can, you can keep or cut. That's the stabilization. So the advantage of stabilizing is that it raises the question, what is the least genus surface in which this knot could live? You could try getting to it by surgery. And it turns out that if you do the stabilized theory, then you get a very nice diagrammatic theory reminiscent of classical knot theory. And so we can use our, you know, whatever combinatorial intuition we have and try to invent new invariants that will be relevant. So that's the motivation. And let's now talk about how you do the diagrammatic theory. And I'll come back to the topology of that in a little while. So we're going to add virtual crossings. We're going to keep the usual Reitermeister moves. And we're going to add the general detour move. Now the detour move needs some examples, but its general form is the following. Here is some piece of diagram. Here are some arcs going into a box. Here are some arcs going out of the box. Here is an arc in the diagram, which is going from here to here and it's all virtual, then you are allowed to cut that arc out and reroute it wherever you please. So I'm just indicating a possible rerouting by rerouting it down through here and back. And of course, when you replace it somewhere else, it has to uh, acquire some virtual crossings. So let's look at an example of this. Here's the simplest virtual structure I can think of. A virtual link consisting of one virtual crossing and one real crossing, like that. Hmm? Now, uh, that would be equivalent to I can cut out the virtual crossing. Um, then I have the rest of it doing what it does. But then this guy here can wander to his heart's content all over the place and cross himself as well and do some funny business and end up back here just so long as this entire pathway is virtual.
So I like to say that the extra move is the detour move, but the detour move is infinitely many things you can do, all of the form, cut out an arc and reroute it, yeah? Um, so if somebody gave you this, you might start to think, oh, that's a bit, oh, I forgot one, didn't I? Um, oh, that's a bit complicated. Um, but then uh, if you look at it carefully, you see that um, uh, starting here, you're going through an entirely virtual path until you get all the way over to here. And so all you need to do is have one virtual crossing for, to connect those two points. And so those are equivalent. Now you might say, well, that's not like the other right question. Was there a question? You might say, well, that, that isn't really like the Rhinomeister moves. Uh, I thought you said it was going to be like the Rhinomeister moves. Um, uh, so uh, let me show you uh, a little set of Rhinomeister type moves that can generate the detour move. We'll do it on another slide. The following moves generate the detour move. These are the virtual moves. They're all quite plausible in the light of the detour move, are they not? This is a self detour. You can cut it out and replace it by that. This is uh, a Rhinomeister two move, but you think I think of it as a detour. Cut out this arc and replace it like that. Here's a a a three type move like that. And then there's one more, which is much more interesting and is really the crux of the matter. Here is two virtual crossings going through here and a classical crossing here. And according to our detour move, I am allowed to, excuse me, I am allowed to, um, yeah. I am allowed to reroute this arc here anywhere I please so I can reroute it down here. That looks like a third randomized remove. It does, doesn't it? Um, and, um, and of course, this is virtual. So it says that I can look for a, a, a two, uh, a two item virtual arc in, in a triangle diagram like that, and I can cut it out and move it down. So I can think of sliding it down if you like a third right of my move of sorts. Um, and the, the basic result is these generate of course this crossing could be the other way this is a type you can switch that crossing and have it switched over here just means classical crossing these generate all detours you might try your hand at seeing why this is so but um but it is basically just that you are going to have some blob in the middle and you're going to have some things here and you're going to have some things here and you are going to be going like this and you're going to want to replace it by something like that. And so if you're allowed to do these little tiny moves, then you can just start edging it, pushing it slowly across until it comes all the way over to the other side. And I recommend that you give it a try, but why don't we give it a try on an example just to see how well it would work. I'm going to have to cut something to move this. That's all right, doesn't matter. 
Okay. Um, let's take a, a more normal example uh, than the one I gave you. Well, not as complicated anyway. Here's a nice virtual knot. We'll in a few minutes prove that this is a non-trivial virtual knot. Okay, got one virtual crossing. Now I could take a more complex version of that one. Let's see what that might be like. Suppose that I decided that I would do that. Now, uh, I just showed you that these are equivalent by a detour. You can take this point here and go all the way over to this point here. Uh, and instead of connecting across this way, I made the detour. Now it has two virtual crossings instead of one. Um, not as efficient. Uh, we want to get from, from this one to this one by a series of elementary virtual moves. Can we do it? Well, let's draw it larger and scribble on it and see what happens. So let's suppose that I decide that I will, I will take this part here and I will move it up here. That's a, one of these kind of moves, right? So let's give that a try and see what it will produce, if anything. Now I'm here. Well, I could keep on doing that. I could do one more of them and end up over here, right? I can take this and this. And instead of, and I did one uh, of these Reitermeister type moves. Now I'll do another one and end up over here. So let me just, uh, to avoid confusion, draw the new connection in another color. So. I want to go from here. Um, uh, let, wait, let's be careful. Um, that's right. I'm going to go here. All right, so the red arc turns into the green arc and there's still a little virtual crossing here. And there's another one here. Right? That's what happened when I did that second one. So proofs by erasure are notoriously bad things to do, but I'll do it. So we ended up here. Hmm. And now this one is just a little virtual one move and it can be removed. Aha. So that goes away. And now this is just fudge. I can, I can pull that back a little bit by planar isotopy. And now you see that this is no different from that. This just happens to have the virtual crossing, crossing here rather than down over there. This is planar isotopic to this. So 
Um, so that's the idea. Uh, if you wish to do a detour move, you can start doing it bit by bit. And, uh, and if you do it bit by bit, then the elementary bits that you need are these. And so another way of saying what our diagrammatic theory is, is it is Reitermeister moves plus these moves on the virtual crossings. And it actually is important to have that around, to have that formulation around for a number of reasons. One reason is that um, you can ask naturally enough, what would it be like to have virtual braids? And we will have virtual braids. We shall have virtual braids. And that turns out to be quite interesting in its own right. But if we're going to have virtual braids, then instead of having a general detour move, we're going to have extra braid moves that look somewhat like these, but made into braided form. Also, once you've focused on these as the basic detour moves, you realize that there are some Reitermeister type moves which you're not going to allow. And I'll show you one. So we just said that this is allowed. And you recognize that it's allowed because it's a detour move. Uh, and now consider the following one. Well, this has nothing to do with our, our theory about doing detour moves, right? Um, it's not a detour move and it's not allowed. And neither is the other one where it goes over. These are forbidden. Not only do they not obviously follow from our definition, but in fact, we can give examples where to show that um, uh, some pair of virtual knots by our pre by the definition I've given you um, are distinct, but um, would become equivalent if you were allowing these moves. The two facts about these moves are that we, um, that allowing one only one, maybe the over one gives a new theory. Called welded knot theory. And allowing both on knots everybody. Uh, we'll come back to that. But the history of this is that uh, Rourke, uh, Colin Rourke, uh, Roger Finn, and Rimiani 
wrote a paper in the mid 90s or early 90s uh, about welded braids and the corresponding theory of welded knots is obtained from the closure of welded braids. Welded braids are very interesting and it's quite interesting to have one of these moves available uh, along with the other moves that I've told you about. And you get a knot theory, but that knot theory is distinct from what I'm calling virtual knot theory and it has its own problems and, and questions and we'll come back to that. Now, um, one of these uh, is um, a little different from the others and I'll come, I mean, in, in its geometry so that one usually chooses one of these rather than the other when one does welded knot theory for essentially diagrammatic reasons. But the welded knot theory could be thought of as just choose one of them. And I'll come back to this as well. Um, so what we want to do now is see what we can do to prove that some virtual knot or link is non-trivial. And uh, I think the link that, that I showed you would be the best candidate to start with. So let's save this. And go back to looking at that link that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, let's orient it. And if we have a link with components A and B, then I will define the linking number of A B to be equal to the summation over C belonging to the crossings of A with B of the sine of the crossing divided by two. That's our old definition of linking number, right? Just extend it. In which case, this link here has linking number one half. So, the only difference numerically between what will happen when you do these linking numbers and when you do the usual classical linking numbers is that you could get half integers. But um, do you see that this is invariant? Well, let's think about it for a moment. We're looking at the classical crossings. We're summing over the, over the crossings that are common between, that have two components in them. Um, and, um, and we, uh, are asking, is it invariant under the Reitermeister moves? And the answer is yes, for the same reason as before, right? You checked before that the linking number was invariant under the Reitermeister moves because you never considered a self-crossing, so um, so that won't that could change, but it won't change. And then you have to consider crossings between components. And you see on a Rennemeister two move that you get a plus and a minus and it adds up to zero. And in a three move, you just permute the crossings and nothing happened. So um, no problem with the Rennemeister moves. And then you go over to the detour. And again, check because you're only calculating on signs of cross of classical crossings. And when you did a detour move, you changed some of the virtual crossings, but you didn't change any classical crossings. So nothing happened to this calculation. It stays the same. So, so this implies that the linking number uh, of A with B in the virtual case is invariant under all virtual moves. Okay, 
So that means you can't take this apart because it's got a non-trivial linking number. The linking number of, uh, of the unlink, like this unlink, u, the linking number of that is equal to zero. Good, so we know that. Um, now, already there's a peculiar phenomenon that occurs here that it doesn't occur in classical knot theory. You have a link here, and if you switch the crossing, you have another link. So there's no way to unknot, undo this link by switching some crossings. But if you have an ordinary link, like the Hopf link here, um, then uh, in, a, in the classical case, uh, why then if you uh, switch some crossings, you can turn it into the unlink. You can take one of the link components and switch crossings to make sure that it, it rides higher than the other one completely, always over. And then uh, they are disjoint from one another topologically. You can just slide them away from one another. So you can undo links by switching crossings, but not, so that's an example of linking number two right there. Um, but not in virtual links. You can have um, a link which has no unknotting number. There's no way to undo it. Um, now, what about classical examples like this? I think we were playing with this classical example a week or two ago. Hmm. And this example, L here, classical example, has linking number equal to zero, but it's linked. And do you recall how we proved that it was linked? We, it was a quandle argument. It was a coloring argument. It was, in fact, a three coloring argument. Um, and I'll recall it for you just for fun because we can make some virtual examples now and use the same kind of argument. But let's recall how we knew that this link was linked. And we didn't even have to orient it to do so. So I'll just draw it again. And we said, we said, okay, I'm going to prove the following lemma. I'm going to prove that you cannot three color this link. Lemma. Call this link L, yeah, L here. L is not three colorable. Now you remember what three colorability was about. I'm just going to use another uh, color for my labels. We're going to use red, blue, and yellow, let's say, okay? And the three coloring scheme is that when red meets blue, you have to have yellow. When red meets red, you have to have red. So I can try to color it accordingly. Let's say that I, um, I color this line red and I color this arc blue. Then this would have to be yellow. And I'm looking for not three col not three colorable non-trivially. That's the lemma. So I try for a non-trivial three coloring there. Now red goes all the way back over to here. And blue goes all the way over to here. And yellow wanders all the way over to here. And blue and yellow are meeting right here so that this blue and yellow, this must create red red okay and blue is coming down here now you have red and yellow so this edge here has to be blue according to the rules but here you have blue and red so this has to be yellow according to the rules and that is a contradiction so that's one case study and you can you, yeah it's generic and you will find that you cannot color this link but L non 
three colorable implies L non trivial. I mean, better to say L implies L is linked. And that was our nice argument due to Ali names in a monthly article a long time ago. Um, why? Because if it were unlinked, then you could start with two circles unlinked and separate from one another and color one of those circles red and the other one blue and then walk backwards from the unlink over to the link because if the link is unlinked then there's a series of randomized moves taking it to the unlink and then there's a series therefore a series of randomized moves taking the unlink to the link so you start with the two colors and start letting them interact and it is a fact about coloring that when they interact they produce new colorings and eventually you come all the way over to the whitehead link and it will be colored. And it has to be non-trivially colored because you got it all the way over to the unlink with two distinct colors on it. So if it's not colorable, it's linked, the inverse argument. So let's, um, let's note that we can do the same coloring, quandle coloring that we were doing before on the virtual knots but we need one more rule about the virtual crossings. What should it be? Think about that while I fix the slide. So we can extend coloring and quandle by which I mean non-oriented or oriented quandle, but we'll stay unoriented here, to virtuals via the quandle or coloring operation like that on the classical crossing just as before. And if you have a virtual crossing, then we'll just leave the colors alone. This can be modified. You can get more powerful invariants often by doing something more complex at a virtual crossing, but I'm going to just let the colors slide right through the virtual crossing as though it wasn't there. And then let's see what we can see. Uh, you're gonna be a little bit surprised. Let's try this guy. And let's try his mirror image while we're at it. So let's say I colored this red. Now this red backs up, stays the same across the top of the crossing and goes all the way through here and comes back here, right? Oh, so this entire arc, that's one arc, and red times red is red. And so that's red. And this is unicolored. Or in other words, not colorable in my turn terminology, but I'll say unicolored. It's only unicolored. You can't get more than one color on it. That doesn't tell you it's knotted. Let's try the other one. Same story, right? So, um, so neither of them is going to be detected in its coloring uh, 
So that won't help. We're going to have to Purdue use some other method to show that this is a non-trivial knot. On the other hand, let me show you another example. Red, blue, red, blue, yellow. Yellow is propagating all the way along here and all the way over to here. Um, well, yellow, red, blue, that's okay, right? Um, red is propagated all the way back over to here, red, um, and um, blue here. And red and blue have to have a yellow, and that's fine. So this is consistently colored in three colors. So that's okay. So this is three colored. And therefore, non trivial. But we have yet to prove it is not classical. Now, what do I mean by saying that a virtual knot is classical? K is classical. If K is equivalent virtually, including detours, to K prime. And this is a diagram without virtual crossings, okay? That's a classical. So um, it, it's perfectly possible to have a classical, which might fool you a little bit. So for example, uh, this is a silly example. Here is a diagram, but this is classical. Right, because you can pull that. It's equivalent to this diagram, which is indeed a classical diagram. So of course, we could give subtler examples, examples where it wasn't so obvious at first that it was equivalent to a classical diagram, but by some moving around, it actually was a classical diagram after all. Um, so what we have proved here is that this is definitely non-trivial. There's no way to get rid of everything. But on the other hand, we're going to have to work harder, actually quite a bit harder, to prove that this example is not classical. Um, on the other hand, it's going to turn out to be very easy to prove that these are not trivial, even though uh, the coloring doesn't help. Now, um, I said it would be interesting to take the whitehead link and do an example with it, so let's do that. Let's start with the whitehead link and make an example that's actually a virtual example. Let's see. Well, let me draw the whitehead link again. Now let's just make that into a virtual crossing. Okay. Uh, let me see. Maybe we could do even more. Oh, that, well, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Now this certainly has linking number zero if we assign some orientations because this goes down through and that goes back up through, right? Um, 
But I could, I could be more daring if I wanted to. I could make both of these virtual crossings. And this still has linking number zero because this one goes down through and then it comes back up through. So the linking number of this is zero. What about coloring? Could I, um, could I prove that it's not colorable in three colors? Let's give it a try. Let's say that I color this red and this blue. Oh, okay. And then this would have to be yellow. And now let's uh, get the consequence. This red comes all the way back over to here. This blue walks all the way down to here. And it walks all the way down to here as well. Mm -hmm. um, the yellow walks all the way over to here. Uh, well, you see the contradiction immediately, don't you? Because red and blue on either side of this arc make this yellow. But blue and yellow on either side of this arc make it red. And there's the contradiction. So, uh, so we have proved that this link is a non-trivial virtual link. And it's got few enough crossings so that um, we can try some other things on it as well if we want to, like the bracket polynomial. And while I'm at it, uh, let me tell you about the bracket polynomial. So bracket K extends to virtuals. All definitions the same. And we take the value of a loop next to K equal to dk, where d is the usual minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. And the loop can have virtual crossings in it. Just can't have any real crossings in it because it's a loop in the expansion of the bracket. I'm assuming you remember and maybe did some exercises with the bracket. So we'll do an exercise in a moment. Um, and what else do we need to know about it? Um, just that a, a single loop will still be evaluated to one. So for example, that means that this is equal to one. Okay. Oh yeah, and we're going to normalize the bracket to get the FK. Um, and uh, the normalization is going to be minus A cubed to the negative rive of K, just like we did before, times the bracket of K. And the rive of K is equal to the sum of the signs. Same as before. The whole definition exactly the same as before. And it will be Bracket K will be invariant under R2 and R3 and detour. And FK will be invariant under R1, R2, R3 and detour. So best of all possible worlds. Let's do an example or two of this. So let's go back to our link and compute the bracket. Can't be hard, it's only got one crossing. So I'm gonna smooth it this way for the A crossing.
and the other way for the A inverse crossing. So I'm going to have A times something plus A inverse times something. And then a bit of erasure will get us the something. This is the A smoothing. Right. And there's the B smoothing. But as I said, a loop with virtual crossings and a single loop at that is evaluated to one. So these are both one. And so we get that this is equal to A plus A inverse. Well, fine. That tells us that this is indeed non-trivial because what would have happened if you had had a disjoint union of these two, this is going to be minus A squared and minus A to the minus two. And once you've normalized them, and you could normalize it by, say, choosing an orientation and multiplying by something, well, let's do it. Let's suppose that I had this oriented this way, um, and that was my link. Then I would have that f of that link is equal to minus a cubed to the minus 1, because the rive of this is equal to plus 1 for the one single plus 1 crossing times a plus a inverse, which is equal to minus a to the minus three, so that's minus a to the minus two, minus a to the minus four. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, this has zero rhi, so this is equal to f of this. And so, our formalism is telling us, yes, indeed, it's linked. We already checked it with coloring, but there is the proof using bracket. Now, having that under our belt, what about calculating the knot that we were wondering about before, this guy? Well, now I'll expand on this uh, crossing here. Let me do it again by picture multiplication. All right, so we get A times something plus A inverse times the other and I'm going to smooth this crossing in the A way. And I'll smooth the other crossing in the A inverse way. Mm -hmm. All right, now think. Uh, this is our favorite link. And uh, so we know what that is. That's A times a plus A inverse for the bracket. And then we have plus A inverse times. Now, what do we get here? Uh, we have a little curl and a little curl. Let's look at it out here. This little curl, you compute the bracket of that. Uh, what is it a positive or a negative curl? Mm -hmm. It seems to be a negative curl. So it's going to be minus A to the minus three multiplied by leaving that bit alone. Okay, so that says this is A inverse times minus A to the minus three, and then times one because the rest is just a spare loop. So we can add all that up and we get A squared plus one minus A to the minus four. Quite non-trivial. And so that's telling us that this is indeed knotted. We're going to have to work a little harder, though. A little harder. Sorry. All 
Alba. Not reacting quite so perfectly right now. Uh, it doesn't seem to want to, oh, yeah, there it goes. It's being clunky. All right. Just wanted it up on the board. All right. Um, and let me clean this bit up. Yeah. So there's our calculation so far. And um, now if we, if we want the full invariant of it, and let's go and get the full invariant, then uh, we want to orient this guy. And now they're both plus, as you see. So that means that the ride is plus two. And so the F of this is equal to minus A cubed to the minus two times a squared plus one minus a to the minus four. All right. So that's uh, a to the minus six. So that's a to the minus four plus a to the minus six minus a to the minus 10 there. Now that's the full in, fully invariant, that's invariant under R1, R2, R3, and detour. And it's asymmetrical. It has big negative exponents, so that FK star, the mirror image, will be obtained by switching all the exponents, right? Putting positives instead of negatives. And that implies that k is not equivalent to k star, and k is not the trivial knot. And now, k is not classical. Proof from here. I'll give you an easier proof. We'll finish with an easier proof, but K is not classical. Proof. All exponents in FK, K classical, are divisible by four. Exercise. I'll tell you the answer next week. All right, but the way we set up the bracket polynomial, you can prove that exponents in the fully normalized polynomial FK will be divisible by four. It has to do with the relationship with the Jones polynomial among other things. And you can prove it directly by thinking about how we defined it. And it works for classicals, but not for virtuals. And in this case, as you see, seven is not divisible by four, for example. And that proves that K is not classical, that, you're, uh, that you can never get rid of, that the, this is necessary. Or in other words, it lives on a higher genus surface. It lives on that torus. It doesn't live in the plane. Um, and so this is a little example of how things work with the bracket. And 
Uh, I'm going to go on for another 10 minutes because we got started kind of late. And I want to show you something else about the bracket that's really very interesting. One of the motivations for studying this subject, in fact. Uh, uh, let me do it by examining the bracket on another example that we had brought up. Let's see what happens here. Let's expand on this crossing, shall we? I hope. Now it looks like things are back to normal on this uh, screen. So, so I'm going to have this and I'm going to have another one. Takes up a lot of room. All right. So we're going to have the bracket of this is equal to a times the bracket of that plus a inverse times the bracket of that. We're going to smooth this crossing this way. That's the a direction, All right? And we're going to smooth this crossing the other way. That's the B direction. Now that's interesting, isn't it? This is a Rademacher 2 move. I could pull it out. And these extra curls can be removed for because they're just virtual curls. So if I did that, I would get that this is equal to A times the bracket of plus A inverse times the bracket of I'll be careful there. All right. Now, this is where the smoothing was, and this is where the smoothing was. That looks like um, an A smoothing and an A inverse smoothing for a crossing. Uh, does it reconstruct? Let's see. Then we would be looking at this, and this is supposed to be an A smoothing, which means that this would be going down here, and that would be going that way, right? That's the A smoothing, right? And over here, the B smoothing this way. Yeah, that's this. Oh, it's correct. But wait, that's equal to the bracket of right master two move here. This, which is equal to minus a cube. So if this not is k then we just showed that the bracket of k is equal to minus a cubed and the f of this k is one normalized out. Isn't that interesting? Because this example, and we know it's non-trivial, right? We know it's non-trivial. We proved by coloring, coloring, implies that k is non-trivial. So, so we have a non-trivial, not with 
Jones polynomial equal to one. Virtual not. Ah, but we haven't proved it's virtual. Maybe it's classical. I could show it's actually classical. If I could show that I could move that around and get rid of those crossings, then um, then it would uh, be publishable in the uh, New York Times, right? Um, because that's an outstanding problem. We don't know any examples of classical knots with Jones polynomial equal to one. And we don't. And this is not classical. And we have to prove that it's not classical. And that's going to happen next time because we haven't time this time to prove it. But I want to show you that this is actually a phenomenon and we can make lots of examples of this sort. What happens is that the kind of calculation that I just did here generalizes quite sweetly and lets me make examples of this kind very easily. Let's look and that'll be the end of today. So I want to look at the general case of a crossing which is flanked by two virtual crossings. All right. And uh, we'll expand this in the bracket. And so we get A times uh, the virtual crossing. And then this goes along like that. And then the virtual crossing. And then we get A inverse times a virtual loop and a virtual loop. But this is equal to A times parallel plus A inverse times vertical, if you like. And this is equal to the expansion of the crossing looking very much the same as it did before with these two knocked out. So we have this little lemma about reducing a diagram that had a couple of extra virtual crossings. So now watch this. This is quite uh, a remarkable coincidence of things. I have a classical crossing here and I decide that I'm going to fix it to make a virtual crossing out of it by continuing on down from the top and going through virtually, then going up through classically and down through virtually like that. And I'll call this virtualization. Virtualize this crossing. That's how I got from the trefoil knot to our example. I got to this point and then instead of going under, I went virtual and then under and then virtual. So let's do that. We do virtualize. Now, uh, according to the lemma above, this has the same bracket as, let's draw it again. And fix it accordingly. Now, there's nothing up my sleeve. That is exactly the way I smooth these, right? Coming in, then there's the crossing and coming back out. That's the smoothing I use. This has the same, and this is equivalent to this, the original crossing switched. And this would call this arrow switch. So what's the moral? The moral is that if you virtualize and compute the bracket of that guy, 
it's going to be the same as the bracket of the original classical with the crossing switched. So that explains how it happened that we got the unknot because when you switch this crossing here, of course you get an unknot in this classical diagram. So that explains the whole thing in that sense. But it also tells us, what does it tell us? We can do the following. Take any classical diagram. Choose a subset S contained in the crossings of K and virtualize them. But make sure that K goes to an unknot when you switch all of S. then f of k tilde will be equal to one. This is just the generalization of what I said. So for example, you might take this torus knot. Yeah. And what do you need to do to, to turn this into an unknot? You could switch it here, and then that would go away. And yeah, well, you could switch it here. And uh, it would become unknotted, wouldn't it? So we could virtualize both of these and end up with uh, a uh, virtual knot that had Jones polynomial equal to one. We can do this with any knot whatsoever. So I just take any non-trivial knot, choose a subset of crossings which will undo it, and you can always do that, remember? You can use a descending diagram and find it. Um, so that means you can make infinitely many k tilde with f k tilde equal to one and non-trivial but that is for next time, proof next time. But the reason they're non-trivial is similar to the reason that I showed you in the case of our example. In our example, we knew it was non-trivial because it had a non-trivial coloring. And that can be generalized to show that you can start with, um, no, I'll tell you now, and that'll be the end. I'll tell you the idea. The idea is worth sharing. So I'm going to show you a little lemma. If K tilde is obtained from K by virtualization,
then the quandal of K is isomorphic to the quandal of K tilde, where Q equals unoriented quandal. And remember how that goes, right? You have A, you have B, you have a new operator, A star B. This operation satisfies the quandal axioms. And then in the virtual case, as I said, we will generalize at the first level by just having no special operation going on. So we can talk about the unoriented quandal of a virtual knot just as well as we talk about the unoriented quandal of a classical. So now what we want to look at is the picture for the crossing and the picture for the virtualized crossing. So let's do it. A, B, this is B over here, and this is A times B. So it looks like a little black box with an A and a B coming in and then those going out. Now, this would be the A and this would be the B. Now the B is over, 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 and it goes all the way over to here. The A comes over and comes here. A meets B and becomes A star B. And A star B propagates up to there. So you see there is no change. So when you write the system, the quandal, in terms of the generators and relations that it demands, it's the same. And so that tells you that the quandal of the knot you started with and the quandal of the virtualized are the same. And then it is a fact, a much harder fact, that um, if K is classical, not, and knotted, then the quandal of K is non-trivial. The quandal detects knots. That actually isn't, isn't something we could prove in this course. Um, it depends on some topology whose references I can give you. I'll look them up and figure out what to say to you, but it is true. Depends on the Smith conjecture. Um, so that means that if I start with a non-trivial knot and I find an unknotting sequence for it and make a virtualization with unit Jones polynomial, that virtualization will be a non-trivial knot. And then we have the question, how do we show that it in fact is genus higher than one, that it's actually forced to have virtual crossings that it isn't actually classical and giving us a solution to the hard problem about detection of knots by the Jones polynomial. Um, but in fact, that happens to be true. And I'll be talking about why it's true, maybe showing you something of the proof of that. So, so this hour and a quarter has been an introduction to the diagrammatic side of virtual knot theory. And we showed how we could use the bracket polynomial to get a lot of information and some rather strange information at that. And I'll stop there.